Kurani nui ke runga, ko papatuanuku ke raro, ko ngā tangata ke waingarua, tihei mauri ora. E ngā manuhiri o te hau e whā, e ngā manuhiri tuarangi, e te whānau, haere mai, haere mai, haere mai. Ko ngong taha te maunga, ko rotorua te roto, ko awa hau te awa, no otoroa a hau. Ko Hugh Rawa, ko Marian Okumatua, ko John Townend taku ingoa. No reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. Good evening everybody, thank you very much for coming. Um, it wasn't my intention that my slides showed you where I came from, but you've probably got a good idea already. Uh, it's not really very nice to be introduced with a photograph of boiling mud behind, but um, <laughs> really it is quite apt. I was born within sight and sound, and perhaps more significantly within smell of the Kuido geothermal area in the centre of Rotorua. And I grew up with a lot of geological, geophysical, geographic uh, features in the landscape around me. As those of you who've been to Rotorua know, it's full of hot water, and mud, and steam, and dead manaka. And I think it's probably some of these sorts of images that got me interested in the processes that govern uh, the structure <coughs> and deformation of the earth from quite an early age. I grew up with my family and my brothers and, and parents uh, on a farm outside Ngongataha. And as this photograph shows you, there were volcanoes in almost every direction. The Rotorua caldera is in the centre of the picture. Mokoya, the island, is uh, to the top left. Mount Ngongataha is not shown here, but it's off to the, to the right, to the west. And what you might be able to see is a low, flat mountain in the far distance over here. That's Mount Tarawera. And Tarawera is a volcano that I've had a peculiar affection for ever since I was growing up. I think um, it was the uh, 1986, 100th anniversary of, of the uh, 1886 eruption that really made me realise that volcanoes were, were things that periodically blew up. Now, around Rotorua, there are a number of physiographic features, geographic features that have sort of attracted my attention uh, for many years, not really in a professional sense, but just in terms of being interesting features in the landscape. And I think what interests me most about the Earth is really just the shape of the landscape and what that tells us about how things evolve. So I grew up in Rotorua, went to school there. I then travelled to Japan, where my career as an academic really took off. <laughs> and back then, we didn't have PowerPoint, we used Blackboard. Um, glasses were worn very big. Cars were simplistic. Uh, but that was the beginning of, of quite a long-standing interest in Japan. I've spent two or three years living in Japan and worked on uh, Japanese research topics and, and continue to do so. And it's been a really interesting um, dimension to my studies in geophysics. Um, the character on the front slide, I should have explained earlier, but that was the Japanese character for earthquake, Jishin. Uh, and that was taken from a plaque that had been erected uh, near the site of a, a fault that ruptured in 2011 in the, uh, in the aftermath of the enormous Tohoku earthquake. I then spent uh, four or five years in California uh, doing my PhD at Stanford University, where I worked in particular on the San Andreas Fault. And the San Andreas Fault is very well known to seismologists because really it was the 1906 earthquake on the San Andreas Fault that caused people to understand, in a scientific sense, the link between faults, big cracks in the earth, and earthquakes. And so I really had a very happy time uh, studying in, in the US, and I was also very happy to come back when I was finished. So I came back to New Zealand, and I've been based in Wellington ever since. Now, I don't quite know why my slides are advancing the way they are, but that will keep me on, on track. What I'd like to do today is just give you a bit of an outline of, of some of the things we know about earthquakes uh, these are not necessarily topics that I've worked on specifically um, or can claim responsibility for, but just some things which the last few years of New Zealand history and global history tell us are important when it comes to understanding earthquakes. 
So I'm going to first of all just explain why earthquakes are a lot like elephants. And the key message here is that you get a different picture depending on which part of an earthquake you look at. I'll then talk about the fact that the Earth's crust is a little bit like a pile of sand, and that enables us to describe the background state of the crust quite well. We can describe its average strength and its, its general state of, uh, of, um, of stress uh, reasonably well, but it also means, like a pile of sand, that the Earth's crust is very susceptible to being <coughs> perturbed, and that results in earthquakes. And that probably is why understanding the timing and the locations and the sizes of earthquakes is so problematic. I'd like to talk a little bit about lessons learned from recent and future events in New Zealand and perhaps elsewhere, and then finish by talking about where we go from here, or at least some opportunities for developing our understanding and our assessment of future earthquakes. This is an image, uh, the blue diagram, that was kindly provided by Ursula Cochrane from GNS Science. And it makes the point that when it comes to understanding big earthquakes, you really have to look at them for a long time. Because big earthquakes don't happen very often. The ones that we're most interested in, because they do the most damage, happen least frequently. And so if you only have a short record, like is shown in the upper diagram here, if you only have three records going back just a few hundred years, then you'd probably say, well, what's going to come in the future is going to be just the same. We're going to have big earthquakes every now and again. If you have a much longer record, then you get a better understanding of the grouping of earthquakes, of the randomness, of, of the repeatability of earthquakes, and that gives you a better basis for forecasting the future, although you still don't know exactly what's to come. Now, while I was at Stanford, actually, I went to Israel and Jordan, uh, where the Dead Sea Transform lurks, and we were looking at historic and anthropological evidence for earthquakes in an attempt to extend the record of past earthquakes back about 5,000 years. So in the Middle East, you have uh, cultural artifacts and buildings and bridges and so on, which have been damaged repeatedly in the past. And this diagram here is from a, a fort in northern Israel, looking, up, looking over the Golan Heights. It's called Kalat Namrud, or Mitsa Nimrod. And the blocks here have dropped down out of the arch. And in order to do that, the arch has to have temporarily opened up and then slammed shut again. And this is taken by many people to be almost unequivocal. Well, it is unequivocal because they dated this. People wrote down, they said, you know, last Tuesday there was an earthquake. So it's written down. But this is the sort of evidence we were looking at to understand what the archaeological records in the Middle East could tell us about past earthquakes. And unfortunately, to cut to the chase, the record in the Middle East, the time series of past earthquakes, is very hard to interpret. It's very complicated. It doesn't show nice, well-behaved faults that rupture every few hundred years. And so that gives us pause for concern. I mean, how far back in time do we have to look until we're confident we understand how things work? Well, earthquakes are a bit like elephants, and I just want to show a few examples of why that's the case. This is a diagram showing the big earthquakes, those bigger than magnitude 7, between the, the time of the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi, 1840, and 1940, so 100 years. And there's lots of big circles in the middle of that diagram, and each one of those big circles represents an earthquake that you would quite likely know the name of. The Wired Up earthquake, the Awatere earthquake, the Murchison earthquake, the Napier earthquake. You know, the ones that you can put names to are pretty much all represented there. Well, here are the earthquakes. Hmm. Earthquakes are really hard to predict. <laughs> here are the earthquakes in green. They happened more or less in the time that everybody in this room has been alive. I don't want to be too specific here, but in the last, you know, well, between 1940 and 2008, we had those green earthquakes. And whatever you think about where they're located, you have to say that the middle of the country didn't have much action in that time. It did have earthquakes. There are some you could put, put a name to. Inangahua, Arthur's Pass, Edgecombe. Edgecombe was very influential for me. It was the earthquake that I felt when I was running in a school sports day in Aotearoa. And it was the end of my, uh, my career as an athlete and the beginning of my career as uh, an earth scientist. But it doesn't show up there because it wasn't very big. I mean, there wasn't really much happening in the time that most of us have been experiencing earthquakes until the last few years. So here are the earthquakes in blue. Again, bigger than magnitude 7, shallower than 100 kilometers. And you might be able to put names to most of these, but there are some missing, you might say. So the one 
Down here is the 2009 Dusky Sound earthquake, second biggest earthquake of the year around the world. Who knows about it? Not many people, didn't have much effect. <coughs> then there are ones that we might be able to put names to, the Darfield earthquake, the Kaikoura earthquake, the Te Araroa earthquake. That happened in September last year. No one really cares about it now because it got eclipsed by Kaikoura. What you don't see on here is the Christchurch earthquake. That's not big enough. It was only magnitude 6.2. The point is, depending on when you were born in the last couple of centuries, you'd get a very different picture about the timing of earthquakes. And so, you know, on this basis, you know, where would you say the next one's going to be? It's quite a tricky problem. Well, one of the ways we can try and extend our record and our understanding of what's happening is to, is to step back from seismometers and use geological records of earthquakes. In New Zealand, we don't have um, forts all over the um, place that have rock walls that ah. withstand erosion, part erode, and, and so we don't have many anthropomor uh, anthropogenic structures that we can use to, to date past earthquakes, but we do have great geological records and we have great geologists, and here's one of them, I think it's probably Calvin Merriman, uh, it's up to that, down in South Westland looking at a record, a stratigraphic record, records of silts and soils and sands and silts and sands and silts and sands and soils and soils and working out the history of burial basically of a soil horizon. You had a soil there, an earthquake happened, it changed the hydrology, it changed the way the streams flowed, deposited a silty layer and then that's preserved in that rock outcrop. If you go through that rock outcrop and you very carefully detect the different layers and you work out how old uh, the sediments are, you can build up a chronology of earthquakes in South Westland. And this is a compilation uh, from data at that outcrop there called Hokuti Creek and another very famous outcrop called John O'Groats. And it represents a compilation of two very big studies and a lot of thinking. And you can see here the times of the earthquakes going back several thousand years. There are more earthquakes, I think, in this diagram than you'll find for any other fault on the planet. And the interesting thing is that they appear to occur quite regularly, not periodically. It's not that every time the clock ticks, you get another earthquake. But they happen about every 290-odd years in this case. And that makes them one of the sort of most regular big faults that's known. So this is the sort of information that in New Zealand we use to build up a picture of, of our earthquake history. <coughs> And we're very good at it, or at least there are people in this audience who are very good at it. So there's a fault that seems to have, you know, sort of just ticked along fairly regularly. It's a little bit out of whack. It doesn't tick exactly on time. But it's got this long record of earthquakes happening about every 290 odd years. Here's another earthquake, which is sort of maybe at the other end of the spectrum. The Kaikoura earthquake ruptured more than 20 faults in Marlborough. You've all heard about the, the record-breaking number of faults that were ruptured. And the funny thing is that with all the different faults in this area, the earthquake chose to exploit some and not others. So some faults were total exhibitionists. They slipped by 9 or 12 metres or so. Other faults that we might have expected to slip, because we'd mapped them in the past and we knew they were there, they didn't really get out of bed. They couldn't be bothered. And then you have faults like the one extending up the east coast of Marlborough, when there's a lot of slip occurring up here through Kekaringa and offshore, and then the earthquake peters out. Well, why does it peter, peter out up there? What's, what's causing that? There's a lot that we remain to, to find out, that we have to find out about this. But here's an example of an earthquake that, you know, you probably wouldn't have guessed beforehand was going to rupture quite that pattern of faults. So, earthquakes, to cut to the, uh, the, the chase here, earthquakes are like earth, uh, elephants because depending on where you look at them, just like three blind people grabbing hold of different parts of an elephant, you get a very different idea about what sort of beast you're dealing with. The time scales that control earthquake rupture, which happens on you know, milliseconds or seconds or maybe tens of seconds, those are probably quite different from the time scales that control the reloading of the fault. So take the Alpine fault, for example. Okay, every 290 years you get an earthquake. That's interesting because it's sort of repeatable. But why 290 years? What is it that controls that? loading process and that re-rupturing. And then there's the tectonic time scale, which might be tens of thousands of years or even longer, on which the fault evolves. 
So this slide probably has the most words of any of the ones I'm going to show you, and I, I don't want you to remember them, but I just want you to sort of think about the things that seem to matter when it comes to the physics of earthquakes. So earthquakes involve frictional sliding between two blocks of rock. It's governed by the material properties of those rocks. The rocks are not, you know, this is, this is um, heresy really for a seismologist, but the rocks are not perfect elastic blocks. They're full of cracks, they're full of different minerals, they might have different layers, they're very heterogeneous, but in particular, they're often full of water or other fluids. But let's call it water for the time being. If they're saturated with fluids like water, then the pressures of those fluids are very important in controlling the frictional stresses acting between those two blocks of rock. And the pressures are something which are governed by um, a property of the rocks called permeability. Permeability describes the ease with which fluids can dissipate through a rock mass. And permeability itself is controlled by chemistry and by temperature and by stress, the load imparted on the rocks. And those things, chemistry, temperature, and stress, are controlled by quite different processes, by tectonics, that is, by large-scale lithospheric processes that load plate boundaries or faults, and by hydrology, just basically by the rain and the snow and the weathering and erosion that uh, affects a particular fault. So fundamentally, and sort of a message that I, I like to um, emphasize, is that the processes involved in earthquake nucleation, <coughs> propagation, and radiation, that's generation of seismic waves, and reloading, are in different ways intimately, associ intimately associated with chemical and thermal and hydraulic effects of fluid transport in the fault zone. So it behoves us to understand the structure of a fault, the pressures, the permeability, the stresses, the frictional properties, in order to build up a picture of what controls earthquake activity. And we need to do this on many different timescales. I'll put this in very briefly, but just to say that, you know, part of the reason we know these things is because sometimes we conduct rather unintended experiments. This diagram in the top left-hand corner is a little hard to see, but that's the state of Oklahoma. And those are earthquakes occurring between 2000 and 2009, the orange dots. Those are the earthquakes between 2010 and 2017, making Oklahoma now the center of earthquake activity in the US. So California has lost its crown. Washington has lost its crown. Alaska has lost its crown temporarily. Oklahoma is ground zero. And the reason it's ground zero is because they have all these wastewater disposal wells. So these are, in blue, the wells that are used to dispose of wastewater produced during oil extraction. And it's no, no particular coincidence that by injecting large volumes of water, they seem to have triggered large amounts of seismicity. So the exact link between, the, between the, the fluids and the earthquakes is a tricky one to, to tease apart. But Oklahoma is obviously doing all its best work at the moment to try and understand what happens. Because these are earthquakes that affect people. They might not be as big as you know, Wellington looks forward to, but they will definitely um, uh, cause a lot of unease in a state like Oklahoma. So let's talk a little bit about you know, the background to this activity. And I'm going to use the analogy here of the crust as a great big pile of sand. As you know, if you take uh, a bucket of sand or um, a big amount of sand, you dump it on the ground, it forms a cone, and it forms a cone with a typical slope, an angle of repose, and that's governed by the frictional interactions between all the grains of sand in that sand pile. And the same is true for a sand dune like this, and it turns out that the same is true for the crust if you squint. So here are measurements that, in fact, I worked on for my PhD. This was not, in, uh, uh, this was not on San Andreas particularly. This was a global compilation of stress information, the, the loads, the forces imparted on rocks from deep boreholes all around the world. And the deepest borehole represented here is nine kilometers deep in southeastern Germany. And the data are shown in those black dots with lines in the center. And I'm not going to explain exactly what they mean, except to say that that line marked <coughs> 0 0.6 here is a line that you would calculate based on the frictional properties of rocks measured in laboratories. So people have measured the properties of, of rocks in laboratories. You can do a calculation, and there's an expert in that in this audience, and put it on a diagram, and you see that the stresses magnitude in real rocks 
and the real Earth's crust are compatible with very simple frictional interactions between blocks of rock. And the crust as a whole is more or less right on the brink of failure. If you tweak it a little bit, you can often generate earthquakes or, or little, little amounts of slip. This is a, uh, a rather old diagram uh, published in 1997 showing, in particular, the earthquakes. This is a histogram of earthquakes that were induced at nine kilometers depth by intentionally increasing the fluid pressure. So by increasing the fluid pressure, they weakened the rocks and induced earthquakes, little earthquakes. But these were induced by changing the fluid pressures by only about 1%. So very small perturbations were able to induce a little bit of slip, not, a, not anything major, fortunately, uh, and, and some earthquakes. And so this and other sorts of observations worldwide suggest that the crust is right on the brink of failure, and if you push it just a little bit, you can trigger earthquakes. Well, as part of my work, we also looked at the role that different faults in the Earth's crust play <coughs> in controlling not just the stresses, but also the fluid pressures. And so this is a diagram which will be um, probably unintelligible to almost all of us, but it's <coughs> making the point, which is summarized here, that stresses and fluid pressures, the things that matter to a fault, are both controlled by a particular set of fractures in the Earth's crust, and they're right at the edge of failure. So if we have an earthquake, we trigger <coughs> aftershocks, that sort of process. And it doesn't take much to do it. Now fortunately, as you know, for every large earthquake, there are many little ones. And that's described by a relationship uh, called the Gutenberg-Richter relationship, which is illustrated here. That's magnitude along the bottom and number of earthquakes basically up the side. And the squiggles down here are si well, these are seismograms showing little earthquakes occurring over a 24-hour period in Canterbury following uh, earthquakes down there. When it comes to size, though, you know, you've got to remember that other factors are important too. Because the Darfield earthquake, which was magnitude 7.1 or 7.2, that caused quite extensive damage, but it wasn't, it didn't cause any fatalities, it didn't um, cause anywhere near as much damage as some of us might have expected. But then the Christchurch earthquake, which came along four or five months later, you know, that caused 185 fatalities in Christchurch and ongoing problems and, and the triggering of other earthquakes and so on. So when it comes to studying these big earthquakes, we also have to take advantage where possible of the little ones because we've got many, many more of them to look at. And the way we do that, increasingly, is to use some sort of sophisticated signal processing techniques. We record data continuously. The seismometers are just humming. They're recording information, um, you know, 200 times a second in three different directions at, you know, 300 places in New Zealand. It's a lot of data. And we can't sacrifice too many graduate students to finding all the earthquakes embedded in there. So fortunately, some of them have come up with cunning ways of targeting specific earthquakes in very, very long strands of noise. And this method, which was developed originally overseas but has been sort of taken to heart by many students uh, working here and others in New Zealand, involves having recorded a big earthquake, you use that as a target and you search for little copies of it in the continuous record. And that gives us very good information about earthquakes that are very small. They could be you know, as small as magnitude zero or as small as magnitude minus one. I mean, these are tiny, tiny little things, but you get a lot of them, so you can really interpret things. I put this in here mostly just to, to revel in the fact that these earthquakes can be so, so similar. Each one of these wiggly lines is a seismogram from a different earthquake, in this case recorded not in New Zealand but in, in um, Alaska. Each one of these wiggles you can see is sort of, sort of the same, but incredibly, if you stack them all up and you, you do it, Sensibly, you get this waveform down here, which is just such a nice, elegant waveform to describe earthquakes happening over many months or many years at sort of the same block of the crust. And we can look at their size distributions. And this is a, a slide made by a graduate student or postdoc now, Calvin Chamberlain. And each one of these earthquakes looks almost the same as all the others, but they vary in size here by about a factor of 200. Some of them are tiny, tiny little earthquakes, and some are only rather small earthquakes. So with these sorts of techniques, we can utilize all the data that's being collected and expand our knowledge of earthquakes by focusing on the little ones as well as the big ones. So I'm just going to go through a few slides to show you some of the lessons we've learned from recent earthquakes. And I'll do this reasonably swiftly because it's mostly photos. But 
I've been involved in this thing called the Deep Fault Drilling Project for several years, in which we've been targeting the Alpine Fault, where I showed you data from earlier, in order to understand something about how large plate boundary faults evolve, how they generate earthquakes, what controls the timing of those earthquakes, and to take the to, to measure the, the state of health of the fault late in its earthquake cycle. Now, I didn't emphasize this earlier, but all that data that's been collected by people like Ursula Cochrane and Calvin Berryman and, and other people, uh, Jamie Howarth and co, that tells us that these earthquakes on the Alpine Fault happen every you know, 250 to 300 years. And Jamie has got some great data that he's going to publish soon, which you know gives me the absolute willies. But what we'd like to know is, when the next earthquake happens, under what conditions did it happen? What was its temperature? What were the pressures it was exposed to? That sort of thing. So that's what the Deep Fault Drilling Project is addressing. And we've done work down there for, for several years on, on different, uh, sort of different campaigns. The most recent big campaign was in um, 2014 when we spent um, a rather long three and a half or four months down there. Things didn't go entirely according to plan. Uh, and the weather wasn't always as nice, but it nevertheless was a very nice um, experiment to be part of, and we had a huge science team, and we drilled about 900 metres deep into the ground. We didn't go through the Alpine Fault, as you may have heard, uh, but it's still too raw a topic for me to discuss, so I'll <laughs> move on. In studying the fault, we, we couldn't just sort of you know, look at rocks or measure fluids or something. We had to sort of measure everything. So we measured... The earthquakes happening nearby, these are little earthquakes, but we installed our own network of seismometers. We measured the properties of, of chips of rock coming out of the borehole. We looked at the mineralogy, the fabrics of the rocks, and what that told us about what we were drilling in and what it signified. We had a, a, a lab on site that could make thin sections for looking at under microscopes. We collected water coming out of the fault zone. We collected gas. Uh, the water shown in the picture here is about 43 degrees Celsius, which is a very nice temperature for a bath. And that was at only 240 metres, and I'll return to the significance of that a little later. We then also installed all sorts of fancy gear into the borehole to measure electrical properties, seismic properties, uh, natural radioactivity, um, all sorts of things. And we built up a picture which has data collected every few millimetres all the way down this 900 metre deep borehole. So you can imagine that there are so many different facets to this data set to try and interpret and understand the structure of the fault, what controls what, how things might be changing given that we're you know, in the late stages of the next earthquake cycle. And there is a huge team of people working on this information. Now one of the key findings from this project was that it's very hot uh, in the core of the Alpine Fault. So generally speaking, if you were to go out um, to a random point on the globe, on land, and drill a hole, the temperature would go up about 30 degrees Celsius for every kilometre, roughly speaking. In the case of the Alpine Fault, it goes up at about 120 degrees per kilometre. That's four times as high. And that makes the Alpine Fault one of the top 1%, if not even more rarefied, boreholes in the world. And generally speaking, when you find a hot borehole, it's because you're drilling next to a, a volcano or a you know, sort of active geothermal system. This is not that. This is hot rock coming up from purely tectonic processes, not volcanic, not magmatic. And we've got various lines of evidence for that. But the key message here is it's very hot down there. So the, the, the really important curve here is this one here, showing that the temperature at the bottom of the borehole was over 100 degrees, even within a kilometre of the surface. Why is it so hot? Well, it really exemplifies the two components of, of the, the um, fault mechanics problem. This tectonics, which is driving up the Southern Alps. It's lifting the Southern Alps up at about 10 millimetres per year or so. Uh, they'd be getting taller, but they get eroded at the same time. That's tectonic processes. But it also is very uh, important to consider the hydrologic processes, the, the fact that it rains a lot on the West Coast. And that rain seeps, in, seeps into the hot rock and extracts all that heat and concentrates it in the valleys. Now the reason this is important is because faults and the materials that make them up in many, in many regards have a thermal dependence. You know, the frictional properties are uh, dependent on temperature and if you heat them up too much you change the, the slippability of, of rocks. Uh, there are many processes that are temperature dependent and to find a fault like this 
that we know produces big earthquakes you know, every 300 years or so, and which last ruptured in 1717. This is pretty interesting stuff. So there's a lot of ongoing research to work out what that means. You know, what does that tell us about how deep into the Earth's crust the next earthquake will rupture? That's an important question. So now, if you go down there, you see a very elegant uh, green shipping container with um, solar panels on the front and a telemetry system on the roof. And inside, you see a very nice laboratory like this. Um, and there's a big hole in the floor. It's covered over at the moment, but there's a hole in the floor with the top of the borehole there. At the moment, there's not as much inf instrumentation in that borehole as I would like to see. It's 400 metres deep here. We can access the top 400 metres. It's about that big, and it would be great to be installing as much instrumentation as we could think of in that borehole, because at some point, it's going to be ground central for a big earthquake. And so the more records we have of what conditions were at that time, the better. The other big event of the last few years, well, sorry, that's not correct. One of the other big events of the last few years was the Kaikoura earthquake in November. And I should just point out now the, the picture that you saw on the, uh, the flyer for this talk is of Rob Langridge, who's from GNS Science, and he's the one with the, the uh, nice long johns, measuring with a GPS sensor the shape of the main trunk line near Kekadengu on the east coast of Marlborough. And I put this slide in and the other ones here, not because I want to go into all the nitty gritty, but to point out that when you are responding to an earthquake like this, you have to measure, again, almost everything. You use GPS. These measurements up here are GPS measurements of the horizontal displacements of the, of the Earth's crust. Uh, these ones here are vertical measurements, measuring how much the crust went up or down. You use radar satellites. This is a, something called an interferogram, which is a, a radar picture of the amount of displacement that took place during the earthquake. And then Niwa went offshore with their boat, the Tangaroa, and surveyed the seabed and found the fault there. And there were geologists mapping it on land, and they were mapping the coastal uplift, and there were seismologists looking at all sorts of interesting stuff. This is a very multifaceted community response because earthquakes produce so many different types of signal. And no one signal tells you everything about that elephant. I just also want to take a brief opportunity to point out that Victoria, and in particular our students, uh, were not the one in the orange there, he's, uh, he's much too old, um, <laughs> but our students were in the thick of it, almost from, from day zero, day one. Jesse Kurse went into the field and, and didn't come out for several weeks. We had um, <coughs> seismology PhD students going out to put out extra seismometers. We had other students helping with the um, installation of GPS, extra GPS antennas. And Tim Nuttall, who's been studying the fault, faulting in this part of the world, was working with colleagues from GNS Science and from other universities to really document and interpret as many of these sort of ephemeral features, like these cracks in the ground here, as they could. Because give it another winter or two and you won't be able to see anything there. So it was a huge community response. And, and there were so many different organizations and, and people involved. And it was really amazing to see. Now, when it comes to earthquakes, of course, as we've seen, uh, there are lots of little ones, and there are a few big ones, and big fleas have little fleas. Big earthquakes generate lots of aftershocks. And this is a diagram which was made quite early on in the aftershock sequence. Each one of these little beach ball type things represents not just the size of the earthquake, its magnitude, but also something about the type of faulting involved. And I won't explain that now, but this is telling us that you know, the, Alpine, uh, the Kaikoura earthquake ruptured from North Canterbury up towards Kaikoura and up along the Marlborough coast. <coughs> And it triggered aftershocks in more or less the same general vicinity. <coughs> What's interesting is that you know, this is where the earthquake stopped off the co coast of Cape Campbell. This is where the aftershocks largely stopped, although there have been a few doozies in the middle of Cook Strait. And in fact, you know, there have been aftershocks, or at least triggered earthquakes, extending much further away than this, up the east coast of North Island, which I'll get to in a second. Now, how does that work? Well, earthquakes talk to each other. If you have an earthquake, particularly a big earthquake, what it does is it locally alleviates some of the stress acting on the fault. You know, the stress drops. But in doing so, it causes a redistribution of stress in the surrounding crust. Some parts get um, more stressed, some parts get less stressed. And the calculations to work out what goes up, what, what gets more stressed, which is red in this diagram, and what goes down, which is blue, those are, are 
sort of easy calculations to do, although they're a bit beguiling because they seem to suggest you know everything about what's going on. And we clearly don't. But anyway, you can do these calculations and it's used to inform our understanding of where we expect aftershocks to be. And, you know, you could look at this diagram and you could say, and you'd be right, it doesn't do a particularly good job. You know, we've got aftershocks happening in, in blue zones and we've got, you know, aftershocks all the way down here. I'll also draw your attention to the fact that the, the stresses here are very small. Two megapascals. That's maybe one or, you know, two percent um, or half a percent or one percent of the stresses acting deep in the Earth's crust uh, that are acting on these faults. So it's a trivial amount of stress change and it doesn't seem to do a, a perfect job at all of explaining where the aftershocks are. But interestingly, we also, thinks, we also saw things happening much further away. These are GPS records from Gisborne, way up the east coast of North Island. And each line represents a different GPS sensor, just sitting there minding its own business, fluctuating a little bit, and then suddenly when the earthquake happens, they all just, just moved very quickly by several millimetres towards the east in this case. So why does that happen? I mean, what's responsible for triggering slip so far away? Well, that slip is called slow slip because it's like an earthquake, it looks like an earthquake, it smells like an earthquake, but it's happening quite slowly compared to a regular earthquake. And what we saw after Kaikoura is slow slip occurring along much of the Hikarangi subduction zone. The yellow colours here represent slip happening on the interface between the Australian plate and the Pacific plate beneath the North Island. There was also ongoing deformation, ongoing slip occurring beneath Marlborough because you can't just have a whopping great magnitude 7.8 earthquake and then expect everything to go back to normal. The faults continue to creep for a while afterwards. But, you know, a big question for the seismological community, for the geological community is, okay, what does this mean? First of all, what triggered it? Secondly, what does it mean if you didn't start slipping? Here's a portion of the subduction zone which is inferred to be stuck, uh, to be an area that, if it ruptured in an earthquake, would produce a very big earthquake, magnitude 7.5 or 8 or something. And we need to know how to incorporate these sorts of phenomena into our aftershock forecasts. Typically, aftershock forecasts are done in an almost entirely statistical manner. You look at where the earthquakes are occurring, how big they are, how many there are, and you can say something about how many are likely to come. But here we have something which really isn't incorporated with our existing models. So GNS Science is currently leading the charge to understand how do we incorporate new information that we get from new geophysical measurement networks into the aftershock forecasts. And that's a real a challenging problem, which no one really glo globally has, has solved yet. Now, I need to get this off my chest. <laughs> what about the moon? So the moon has... We, we had a supermoon at the time of the Kaikoura earthquake record. The moon does have a measurable and very small <coughs> effect on earthquake timing. The earthquake induces tides, earth tides, ocean tides. Sometimes the moon is closer and looks bigger. Sometimes it's further away. And if you look very carefully at long records of seismicity, you can see that the moon has, has some effect. But the tides are going up and down every 12 hours, every 24 hours, on various time scales all the time. There's a full moon at least once every month, and there's a full moon everywhere. There are tides everywhere. And also, if, if you trigger an earthquake, the triggering doesn't by itself tell you how big it's going to be. So the moon may have some effect on earthquakes, but it doesn't tell you anything about when or where or how big they're going to be. And so you can see that in the event of a, a big earthquake like Kaikoura, when the media gets so excited about the moon, it's really not the key problem. I mean, there are other things to be worried about. Anyway, sorry, that was just to get that off my chest. Um, I'll stop. Where to from here? Well, I just want to end with a couple of slides making the point that when it comes to earthquakes, we have really improved our understanding of what sorts of processes are involved over the last few decades. Um, and, you know, that gives us a lot of new information about uh, how we can forecast the future. There are some parts of the world, like Japan, where they've been doing this in some senses for longer, and they've invested a large amount of money in this problem. And this is a diagram that came out in January of 2011, showing the locations along eastern Japan in particular, 
of anticipated earthquakes and the likelihoods of having a big earthquake in the next 30 years. And you can't read these probably very well, but I'm going to highlight this one here. This said that in the region of Miyagi Prefecture, there was a 99% chance of a magnitude 7.5 earthquake in the next 30 years. So that was as close as this committee was able to get to saying, you know, it's almost a dead certainty. Unfortunately, it turns out they were right in that this was the location for the next earthquake, the big earthquake to hit Japan, but it wasn't magnitude 7.5, it was magnitude 9. And that had a much more devastating effect than it would have had if it was only magnitude 7.5. So that's not to say that this sort of exercise is futile, because in fact in preparing for that earthquake there, they instrumented this part of Japan even more than other parts of Japan. They put GPS sensors on the seabed, they conducted um, offshore mapping using geophysical methods, they really understood this part of the world quite well, and that, with hindsight, has enabled us to go back and, and look at the earthquake source. But it's a really fraught business. One of the other things that Japan has invested in is early warning systems. And this is a diagram summarizing time since seismic waves from this earthquake were first detected versus an automatic estimate of how big the earthquake was. And this system, within about 20 seconds of the, of the first waves being recorded, decided that the earthquake was bigger than magnitude 7 and issued, sorry, it was 8 seconds after it detected the waves, about 30 seconds after, it, after the earthquake got started. It issued a warning saying there's been a big earthquake and that warning had the effect of stopping, among other things, 24 bullet trains. And it was communicated to power companies, and, and they did various things to shut things down. Unfortunately, Fukushima was, was yet to come, but they got some things right, and they got some things wrong. So they underestimated the magnitude of the earthquake. They said it was about magnitude 8 in the end, but it was much bigger than that. And thus they got the ground motions incorrect, they got the tsunami size incorrect, they didn't send cell phone warnings to all the people that might require them, including Tokyo. And the system struggled because the aftershocks of this event were very big themselves. I mean, we had magnitude 8 aftershocks. But it is possible, you can see, in some parts of the world, notably at the moment in, in Japan and California, to <coughs> utilize autonomous, very rapid measurements of seismic waves to say something about what's coming. What would we do if we had something between 10 seconds and 100 seconds warning of seismic waves coming. I should have made the point that in the case of Japan, when they issued that warning, they issued that sufficiently rapidly that people received the warning message before what's called the S waves, the, the secondary waves, arrived. And so they were able to take some steps to protect themselves. We're not really in a situation yet in New Zealand where we could do this ourselves. But given that we have some faults, the Alpine fault is one of them, that has a very long record, an enviable record in some senses, of big earthquakes. And given that on average they happened about 300 years, and it was about 300 years since the last one, we need to think about whether or not <coughs> we're doing enough with our infrastructure to prepare for what's probably a dead cert, an earthquake at some point in the next few years or decades or centuries. So the present really is the key to the past. This is a line which uh, underpins most of geology. You sort of have to believe it if you want to be a geologist in order to interpret past tectonics, past uh, evolution of the, of the Earth in terms of what you see operating at the present day. But there is a caveat to that. You have to sometimes wait a long, uh, reasonably long period of time to ensure that you know what the present tells you. And in the case of earthquakes in New Zealand, obviously, if you'd only been here between 1940 and you know, 2008, you'd have probably got a very different picture from if you'd been here 100 years earlier and seen all these big red earthquakes. And so I think we need to be working on many different levels to understand geophysics, the geology, the hydrology, many different facets of these uh, earthquakes in order to better prepare New Zealand for what is almost certain to come. I'd just like to end by acknowledging that most of the work that academics do is not really their own work. In fact, almost nothing is done by the academics. But most of it is done by graduate students and postdocs. And I've been very lucky to have a really great bunch of, of graduate students and a small uh, but nevertheless great bunch of uh, postdocs working with me ever since I arrived um, in New Zealand, uh, back in New Zealand. And Natalie Balfour was my first student, my first master student. She's now employed at Geonet. And uh, you know, this is ordered by time. Um, and it's just been great. 
because most of what we achieve is, is done by taking enthusiastic young graduate students and sending them out into the field or into the, lab, in, into the laboratory if they, if they don't want to go out into the field. I'd just like to finish then by acknowledging all the people that have helped me uh, get to this place. In fact, I'm not acknowledging everybody. It's just a select few. But I do want to thank my family, in particular my parents and my brothers, uh, Marion and Hugh Townend and my brothers, Thomas, Andrew and Oliver, um, my wife Erica and our children, Meredith, Amelia and Patrick, none of whom has left this talk, which is great. <laughs> um, I'd like to thank my scientific colleagues, and I can only thank a few of them here because there are so many, and that's one of the great um, benefits of working in science. But I'd like to particularly thank colleagues at Victoria, uh, Richard Arnold from Statistics, uh, Tim Little, Martha Savage, Colin Wilson, and Rupert Sutherland, all from uh, the School of Geography, Environment, and Earth Sciences. It must mean it's time to be quiet. And I'd also like to acknowledge and just list a few names of colleagues further afield, so Stephen Bannister, Simon Cox, and Virginia Toy at GNS Science and the University of Otago, and many colleagues in New Zealand and worldwide. In order to understand earthquakes, you really have to work with a, an international perspective. And finally, I'd like to thank some mentors who've really given me a lot of encouragement along the way in different ways. They might not realise that they were considered mentors, but um, they really provided useful advice and sometimes some um, less useful advice. Um, <laughs> Helen Anderson was my first geophysics lecturer at the University of Otago. Bill Ellsworth was at the US Geological Survey when I was doing my PhD and is now at Stanford. Rick Simpson, who is here this evening, uh, was the head of department when I was doing my geology degree and had a lot of input into where I ultimately ended up doing my PhD. Thank you, Rick. Colin Wilson was my first boss, and those of you who know Colin uh, would rep uh, recognize um, what an achievement it's been for me to still be here. <laughs> <laughs> I've, told, I've told Colin that, and he, he, um, he laughed and wished me all the best. And finally, um, I'd like to thank Mark Zobeck, who was my PhD supervisor, and who uh, serendipitously is uh, coming to New Zealand on sabbatical in a few months' time. And without these people and many others, uh, academics wouldn't, wouldn't thrive, and I've been very lucky. So thank you very much, and uh, thanks very much for coming. <laughs>